That young fellow with a cocky grin is me, Jimmy Doolittle. The year was 1925. I was 29 then, seven years older than the airplane itself. You can see I was pretty pleased. I had just won the Snyder Trophy race for seaplanes held in Baltimore that year. Later that same day, I set a new speed record in the Curtis R3C2 that is now on exhibit in the National Air and Space Museum. The 1920s and the 1930s were good years for me and for most of us involved in aviation. We were moving out of the era of wooden airplanes and seat of the pants flying. Powerful radial engines, new instruments, and other innovations led to a new generation of aircraft. The public wasn't always aware of these technological advances. Attention focused on the tip of the iceberg, the record flights, the air races, and the great flights of exploration and discovery. All too often, we pilots were portrayed as daredevils and thrill seekers. But the races, the long distance flights, and the endurance trials were the proof of the pudding. They provided a means of testing and publicizing the new technology. The era began with spectacular long distance flights that showed just how far we had come since 1903. The Atlantic had always been a challenge. The U.S. Navy's Curtis NC-4 was first across in May 1919, flying from Newfoundland to Portugal with a stop in the Azores. Only a few weeks later, two Englishmen, John Alcock and Arthur Whitton Brown, made it non-stop in a Vickers Vimy. U.S. Army aviators achieved an even more impressive first with a round-the-world flight of the Douglas Cruisers in 1924. But it was Charles Lindbergh's 1927 solo crossing of the Atlantic that really captured public imagination. The thousands who turned out to cheer Slim liked to think of him as Lucky Lindbergh, or the Lone Eagle. You realize that this was one of the best-planned flights of the era. It was a perfect demonstration of the latest equipment, like the marvelous whirlwind engine that ran for 33 and a half hours without a hitch. When the spirit of St. Louis landed in Paris, the whole world went wild. Five years to the day after Lindbergh's flight, Amelia Earhart became the first woman to solo the Atlantic. Her bright red Lockheed Vega was every kid's idea of what an airplane ought to look like. That was just the beginning for Amelia. In January 1935, she made the first solo flight from Hawaii to the U.S. mainland in another Lockheed Vega. Wiley Post was an Oklahoma wildcatter who had lost an eye in an oil field accident. The insurance money paid for his flying lessons. Wiley's 1933 solo flight around the world in his famous Vega, Winnie Mae, earned him one of New York's famous ticker tape parades. Post was also a pioneer in pressure suit development. The suit and some changes in the Winnie Mae allowed Post to substantially stretch the range by taking advantage of the high altitude jet stream. The importance of all of these flights was becoming apparent by the mid-1930s. You could write those first transatlantic flights off as experiments, but when the Italian general Italo Balbo led a formation of 25 seaplanes across the Atlantic in the summer of 1933, even the isolationists began to worry. It was one of the most colorful flights of the era, a round trip from Italy to Chicago with stops in other American cities. The operators of commercial airlines were also learning a lesson from the distance flyers. In 1938, Howard Hughes and his four-man crew cut Wiley Post's old around-the-world record in half. Their Lockheed 14 was not an experimental craft, but a modern, well-equipped airliner. Where Howard Hughes went, the airlines would follow. Public attention was also focused on the exploits of flyers in the Arctic and Antarctic. Richard E. Byrd was the best-known polar aviator. By May 1926, Byrd and his pilot Floyd Bennett claimed the honor of being the first to fly over the North Pole. Roald Amundsen and Lincoln Ellsworth 
were on hand to greet Byrd and Bennett when they returned to their base at Spitsbergen. Anderson and Ellsworth were there with the airship Norge and its pilot, Umberto Nobili. Three days after Byrd's return, they made the first transpolar flight, landing in Alaska. In 1935, Lincoln Ellsworth and Herbert Hollick Kenyon took the Northrop Gamma Polar Star to the Antarctic. During these years, aeroplanes helped us to fill in the remaining blank areas on our map. Endurance flights kept newspaper readers entertained and proved the reliability of aircraft, engines, and new techniques like air-to-air -air refueling. The crew of the U.S. Army's question mark set the first significant endurance record in 1929. The question mark made 43 contacts with the refueling plane, nine of them at night, during a total of 151 hours in the air. In the summer of 1935, Fred Key and Al Key of Meridian, Mississippi, kept their Curtis Robin, Old Miss, aloft for an incredible 27 days. Haircuts and greetings for family members were the first order of business when the Key brothers finally landed. Air racing offered another showcase and testing ground for the new aeronautical technology. No speed record lasted long during those years. My own seaplane record of over 245 miles per hour seemed pretty impressive in 1925. But within six years, this beautiful British supermarine S-6B had raised the mark to over 400 miles per hour. Each September, all eyes turned toward Cleveland and the national air races. My old high school chum, Cliff Henderson, was the organizer and manager of these races. Here's Cliff with the Lindberghs at the 1929 event. That year, Slim put on a show with the Hi-Hats, a U.S. Navy demonstration team. He's the one in the middle. By 1932, the national air races had become one of the nation's leading sporting events. The crowds were enormous. Spectators always enjoyed acrobatics and wing walking. But what they really came to see were the races, particularly the Thompson Trophy Classic. Crowds watching a real show today, starting with Jimmy Doolittle, the human bullet. I won that one in 1932, averaging over 250 miles per hour in the GBR-1. It was the most unforgiving airplane I ever flew. You had to fly it all the time. You didn't dare make tight turns. Blow, Jimmy. You did a real job. Colorful and flamboyant, Roscoe Turner was the only pilot to score three wins in the Thompson Trophy race. He always dressed to the nine and occasionally flew with his pet lion Gilmore in the cockpit. But behind the fancy clothes and flair for publicity, Turner was a top-notch pilot and a tough competitor. A number of first-rate woman pilots joined us on the air race circuit. Among them were Ruth Eller, Bobby Trout, Eva Paris, Pancho Barnes, and Louise Thaden, winner of the Women's Air Derby and the Bendix race. Jackie Cochran made substantial contributions. We look back at the 20s and 30s as the golden age of aviation. We've watched thick and wire box kites give way to sleek, powerful aircraft capable of crossing oceans, circling the globe, and opening unexplored territory. War clouds would soon obscure the traces of air show smoke lingering in the sky. But nothing can erase the memory of the men and women with whom I flew during those golden years between the wars. Here's to them all.